Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Psalm TV podcast. My name is Jason Wise. On today's episode, we are going to speak with Alice Anderson of Am Vive Wines in Santa Barbara. We're going to talk about historic vineyards in Santa Barbara that she is working with, regenerative farming, and what makes Santa Barbara such a unique wine region. Before we do that, I want to tell everybody we have a brand new documentary coming out on Psalm TV tonight. If you are listening to this, it's probably already live on William Selium. William Selium Winery is one of the pioneers of Pinot Noir, not just in America, but in the entire new world. And they really forged a path for Pinot that exists today in the wine world. It is a very important winery and one we love. That is airing right now on Psalm TV. And also I want to let everybody know, it means the world to see all of you at the Cup of Salvation premieres. I have been all over the place, New York City, Los Angeles, and uh, the film is still playing in LA and New York. I'm going to be doing a Q&A on the last show, Thursday the 21st, at the Lemley Royal at that screening in Los Angeles. So come and see me, and let's talk about the film. And if you're in New York City, the Village East is playing through the 21st as well. So go out and support us. It means the world. And all of you who listen to the podcast, it's so great to hear you guys talk to me and uh, tell us that you love the pod. It means a lot. Without further ado, our conversation with Alice Anderson from Am Vive Wines. Hello, everyone. I'm Claire Copey, and I am back getting to talk with amazing people throughout the wine industry. And today I'm talking with a really amazing winemaker out of Santa Barbara, winemaker for Om Vive Wines. This is Alice Anderson. Alice, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me about wine. Thank you so much for having me. It's a joy and nice little break up to the week. So thanks. Yeah. And how are, how are you doing? You've come off the end of the 2023 harvest. How did that go? How was the, the growing season for you? Yeah, you know, it was a really, so thinking about it, it's been a really great harvest, a very, very long growing season, um, especially for Santa Barbara County. Um, a lot of mildew pressure and it kind of continued into even when we were still picking grapes. So a lot to think about all still while harvesting, but it ended up being kind of a long and late harvest, but an amazing depth of flavor, uh, really good acids this year. And yeah, I'm psyched on this vintage. It feels perfect for the kind of wines that I make. And I know like some of the riper producers are like, unclear <laughs> and some people still have fruit in the cellar down here which are your fruit in the wow. winery still crushing so yeah as it's beginning of december so that sounds bad i'm glad i've been done for about a month now but um yeah it's been it's been good it's nice to feel a little bit more rested more zen <laughs> you seem very zen you seem very chill <laughs> <laughs> so when Ready. you talk about a later harvest i know there's no typical you know growing like nature always throws something at you so but when would you typically on an average growing season, when would you typically start harvesting and how did that compare to this past year? Yeah. So, I mean, yes, we know there's big fluxes from what is typical these days, but for, uh, and it totally depends on the site. Um, I definitely have sites that I pretty much always pick earlier and pretty much always pick later, you know, and, and this year's pattern also continued on the same, um, on the same path. But for the perspective, Ibarra Young, the vineyard that I lease and farm, um, I picked that the first pick this year was September 8th. And last year it was August 10th. And, you know, last year, the last pick there was September, I think it was September 11th. And then the pick, the last pick this year was October 10th. So wow. almost a month later. And then looking back, 2021 had kind of similar picking dates. Um, and 2020 and 2022 kind of had similar picking dates. So it's hard to say, but yeah. But definitely a later. Cool. It was, yeah, it was a, a very cool growing season. Uh, cool and, we you know, moist in California. So a lot of rain. Um, we grew a lot of canopy kind of everywhere, which, you know, kind of regulates the vigor of the plant a little bit. And so your plant is focused a little bit more on producing leaves and the transition Mm. to ripening its fruit is a little bit later. So that's all that happened, but um, I'm psyched. Everything I hear about 2023 also sounds like wine that I like to drink. So I'm very excited for that. I should have sent you a little, a bottle to have a glass while we're chatting. Yeah, what the heck? Should have thought of that. 
<laughs> Take a rain that. check on that. I'll have to come visit <laughs> yeah. you and we'll, we'll just drink there, make it easier on you. <laughs> please, please. So before we take a deeper dive into Almviv, I'd love to know a little bit more about your background, where you grew up, and how everything kind of led you to a career in wine and winemaking specifically. So I grew up in Modesto, California, um, in the proper suburbs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my mom still lives there. Uh, and, you know, my, my family's not in agriculture by any means. My dad was a lawyer. And my mom was a designer artist. So a little bit. My mom, my mom has designed wine labels and wine packaging since before I was born. So she worked at Gallo, which is kind of why we stuck in Modesto. And then she worked, um, she, we, we moved to Napa and she worked on the uh, design team at Mondavi before they sold. Man, she's working at really small labels. <laughs> I know, right? And really then small. And she kind of, she she switched to freelance maybe when I was, I don't know, 15, maybe a little bit earlier, 10. Um, and yeah, so she's always kind of been in wine labels, wine packaging. And I, for some reason, have been really into agriculture and riding horses. Totally like black sheep in the family did FFA and rode horses every day. Um, my really? parents would take me to the barn and yeah, rode, ride four or five horses a day for literally oh. my entire adolescence and high school years. Um, that's like yeah, the dream it was an FFA in, in, or in high school and then ended up at Cal Poly as a general agriculture major. And then that just like, wasn't quite the right fit for me. And, uh, I did a job shadow with a winemaker up in Napa that my mom set me up with and took a class at Cal Poly in the wine department and yeah, ended up changing my major. So yeah, that was a very long way of, a long winded way of saying I have a degree in um, anology and viticulture <laughs> from Cal Poly. <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's how I got there. Um, yeah. And then after college, I went and traveled. So that's the amazing thing about wine and being young in wine is you get to work and travel and see new things and experience new viewpoints. It's mm. really special. So I lived in New Zealand for seven months, worked at Amosfield and Ripon down in central Otago. And then wow. um, kind of serendipitously, I lived with a French girl who's still my best friend. And she, I ended up hanging out with like only French people in central Togo and I would go to all New these Zealand. Like, yeah, go to all okay. these dinners and we were speaking French. I didn't speak any French at the time. So anyway, I ended up I ended up looking for an internship in France and I ended up at Pierre Gaillard. So I was hired as an intern at first. Nice. And then they asked me kind of to stay full time. So I came back as their hobbyist and I was there from 2015 through 2017. And wow. then that was kind of like my, where I really, truly, after that and Ripon, um, I was like, wow, I really need to grow what I make. There's this amazing connection to the mm. land and there's this huge piece of the story that is missing if you don't feel that. And now that I felt that, like, I can't really go back. And mm. yeah, and then I kind of was like, I met my partner, Topher, uh, in between my visas, just randomly skiing. Uh, and was kind of getting a little bug to move back to, oh yeah, we should just talk about skiing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> getting a bug to move back to California and started working for Justin Willett at Tyler Winery. And that's what brought me back or brought me to the Santa Barbara County in general. Mm -hmm. And yeah, a few years passed and a few jobs later, I ended up kind of dreaming up my own project and started with just Marsan, Saran, Gamay, which are kind of, I don't know, Saran, Marsan. Uh, Marsan is the main white grape in Hermitage, the most important um, white region, in my humble opinion, um, in the Northern <laughs> Round. <laughs> and, Ooh, um, Condru's going to have know. some issues. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. That's okay. And then uh, <laughs> Syrah, of course. And then Gamay is just, you know, living so close to Leon, yeah. that's what we drink. That's the party wine. Um, it was approachable <laughs> and affordable. Um, so yeah, that's that was how I started with those three varieties in 2019, six barrels. 
That's such a huge journey to go from, and to be working in two different hemispheres as well. What What's that like to be going from New Zealand to then, you know, France and then back to Santa Barbara? Is there a lot of huge differentiation with that or is it just similar at, you know, opposite times of the year? Yeah, you know, it's, um, some people really loved that harvest hopping bug and like I have friends that have done it like back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, mm. but it's, um, you miss the full growing season if you're, if you're doing that. And I don't know, I, I like farming too much. I think being outside. Yeah. yeah it's beautiful. The vineyards at Ripon in central Togo are, I don't know if you've ever seen photos, but the most striking, amazing vineyard views ever, mm. you know, waking up to go freeze my little hands off pruning with <laughs> beautiful lake views and snow capped mountains. Um, wow. with the best team ever it was really special and then yeah France is it's its own beast you know I'm a California girl so <laughs> winters in California are easy it's very it is yeah it's really nice here especially on the central coast so France I felt like that was my first real feeling of the seasons um, mm-hmm. living a full year there and maybe people from the East coast or some, or maybe a more mountainous climate, uh, feel more, feel more seasonal, uh, than us Californians. But yeah, it was really striking noticing spring in France, you know, everything's just kind of dead in the winter. And then as you know, the flowers start to bloom and, uh, the vines start to sprout. It's really special. And in Santa Barbara, I mean, it's beautiful here. I, haven't left for a reason. Super, super lucky. So. I want to live there. And I met you there. So what was it? It was like 2019, I want to say, which it feels I like it was only a couple of years. I think it was 2019. Because wow. I, I did some digging wow. in my memory and I was up there for a, for a media tour kind of a thing. And I met you, you were working at the time for uh, Graham to Tomer. Yeah. And I mean, those wines are amazing as well. Yeah. And then he brings I in all this for- knowledge from Austria and Germany too for you. Totally. Yeah. I worked for Graham for four vintages. Yeah. It was, it was amazing. And I kind of like made my, was able to make my wines alongside his and it was, yeah, it was great. Graham, Graham is great. He's, and and being able to, that was my first experience ever working with Riesling or, or Gruner. Of course I've made Pinot before, but yeah, really special. So then around uh, in that timeline, when did you start, how did it all lead to Omviv. Was the Abare Young Vineyard an opportunity that presented itself before you had this idea or was Omviv something that was always going to happen and it was just this kind of serendipitous thing? How did that all go down? Yeah. So Ibarra Young, <laughs> a few people had sent me this advertisement for this lease. And at the end of 2018, I think, I met with the owner's and I just like couldn't pull all the funds together. Just like it was just too much all at once at the end of 2018. So somebody else picked up the lease for the growing season of, you know, 2018, 2019. And I ended up buying fruit from the property in 2019. Um, so Marsan from 2019 is from Ibarra Young. But I sourced Syrah and Gamay from uh, a different vineyard. So the first year of 2019 on these is actually from Show Green Vineyard, who I was consulting winemaking for at the time, which is up in Cat Canyon. So kind of on these came, like I had known about Ibarra Young and fell in love with the site and with the old vines, just like couldn't quite pull it all together farming wise and cost wise, but I still made wine from the site. And then just to kind of like flash forward, end of 2019, we were approached by the people that held the lease at the moment and it just wasn't quite working out for them. And me and Topher were like, kind of put our, our funds together and yeah, pulled it all together. And my little dreams are coming true oh, and started farming awesome. at the end of 2019 and took over. That's, can you tell us a little bit, this is a really historic vineyard in, in Santa Barbara. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about its history? So it is one of the oldest vineyards planted and still in production in Santa Barbara County. It was planted in 1971 by a woman named Charlotte Young, um, which is, you know, I think San Fernando Benedict still has vines planted in 1971. You would know better than me, possibly. 
1971 or 1972. But I think those are the two oldest vineyards um, that are still in production. So there's about six acres of old vines and then four acres of what I call the younger vines, which were planted in the late 90s. So Charlotte Mm -hmm. planted the vineyard and she had always sold the grapes. She was a farmer at heart. She, She wasn't really that interested in making a wine brand or anything. So kind of the grapes all went to bigger wineries back then until Bob Lindquist came around. So Bob Lindquist approached Charlotte with a lease option in 1986. So he began leasing and controlling the farming on the property in 1986. He leased it and farmed it from then all the way until 2018. So the vineyard, he transitioned everything to organic in 1993 before organic was a thing. I definitely credit a lot of the health of the vineyard to Bob. Um, Bob and Lisa are amazing. Uh, He's so great and just really a a nice guy to talk to if I have any questions and call. And yeah, just a really, really good guy. Ever since we started farming the vineyard at the end of 2019, the vineyard had already been no-till for a year. And we transitioned everything fully to regenerative. So started integrating all of our animals started making a lot of our own compost, applying some of the biodynamic preps to our compost. Can you explain what no-till is, by the way, for, for anybody who that what doesn't under isn't familiar with that concept? Yeah, for sure. So no-till just simply means not disturbing the floor of the soil um, with the idea that we're in increasing our soil microbiology as and carbon holding capacity. Um, and also not driving big diesel tractors and destroying destroying soil structure, which all kind of leads to increasing water holding capacity and increased microbial life um, and living roots and native ecology and biologic diversity and all of the good things that kind of feed both us as humans and our vines and makes it happy. Absolutely. And I think it translates to the glass. I mean, in so many other aspects of agriculture, you know, whether it be uh, livestock, other uh, other produce, you really do see such a difference in in the taste of these things when you have, I think, farming approaches with, with the symbiotic, you know, relationships well, of yeah, all of these I've- different it's these minute little relationships that all of these different plants and like you said, all the little microbial life uh, that that just they have huge impacts on each other and when they're all healthy and happy the resulting in this case wine I think you can really just taste it in the glass no totally I mean scientifically there's a lot of like feeling to to, (laughs) do that too that I bring into farming and like intention but that's not very scientific but if we're talking about actual science you know all of the yeast and our fermentations and all the bacteria they come from the soil so you know, if you have a site that, that has been sprayed with Roundup and has no living biota other than the vines and they're just being supported by synthetic fertilizers and, you know, just sprayed with gnarly fungicides, yeah. you you don't have as much life in the wines. It's really special to have it all work together in in unity. I agree. And what are some of the, the things you brought in, like animals? stuff like that that you brought into the property to help sustain that that relationship? Because I noticed you have like a, is it a herd? Is that a correct or a gaggle of ducks oh, that wander the flock. vineyards? What's the correct? A flock. A flock, a flock of ducks. Yeah. And I think they're so cute. What, what, do, what do things like that bring to the vineyards? <laughs> yeah. So ducks were the first animal that we integrated actually um, because we had some snails in this pocket. Ducks are, they're great. They, I, I think... <laughs> They are, they're not used too much in the vineyards because they do require um, a good amount of maintenance, much more maintenance than the chicken. But I do actually like the way they work in the vineyard a little bit better than the chicken. They're a little bit less destructive, in my opinion. Um, they're, they're bigger birds, so they have more poop, which um, you know feeds the nutrient cycle in the soil. And, I've heard their poop you know, is very have, good. Oh, yeah. I've heard duck oh, yeah. poop is, is up there. <laughs> Yeah, it's really high in um, nitrogen and phosphorus, so it's a good thing to have. 
Um, Mm -hmm. And they have big web feet. So they kind of act as a crimp. And so they're kind of like stepping down any sort of grasses that are growing on, on the surface and creating this matted layer that begins to slowly decompose over time and again, feed the nutrient cycle. The ducks are also a little bit less mobile than the chickens. We don't clip our chickens' wings, so they can fly up onto the cordons. And, Hmm. you know, I have to make sure that the chickens are out of the vineyard um, during bud break because, you know, they love the fresh little green buds. They just jump Uh. up and eat all of those. And they eat all of the fruit if they're in the vineyard during after fruit set. And the ducks (laughs) don't tend to do that as much. The ducks are very, you know, they jump up a little bit, like they can jump up a foot, but if your cordon's high enough uh, or your cane, your fruiting system is high enough, they don't tend to bother the vines. They're, you know, more on the floor, which is nice. So yeah, we brought ducks in first. So the ducks have been there since the very beginning of 2020. And yeah, we still have some of the same ducks that we started with. They, they, I think they can very often have a 15, 20 year lifespan, which oh, wow. is crazy. And we've of course introduced new ducks too. And so, yeah, basically we, we have what I call the duck tractor and it, <laughs> it's basically, so they're all surrounded by electric fence during the day um, in the vineyard row. And they all go into their duck tractor at night, just purely to protect them from predators. The duck tractor, like, move the place a day. So every day when I go put the ducks away, I change the water and I push the duck tractor down the vineyard row. So if you can visualize it, just their, you know, their poop is spread throughout the vineyard row at night. Um, so, you know, 12 hours during the day. And then the automatic door lets them out in the morning to um, explore everywhere inside their electric fence and forage for bugs, slugs, and snails and flower tips and grass tips and just do what they do. Yeah. So ducks were first about, I think it was maybe that winter. So going into maybe the winter of 2020 into 2021, uh, Topher built us a chicken coop and we got chickens. Well, actually, I think I probably brought home the chickens first and then was like, <laughs> shoot, we need a hut tomorrow because that's them a kind coop. of how I work. <laughs> Um, and so we built a big chicken hut, uh, which is kind of integrated in with the duck system. So same sort of thing. Um, they go in and out with an automatic door and they forage inside the electric fence during the day. And then every month or so we rotate the whole section. So they go from, you know, one block over to the next block. And that's kind of like year round in the vineyard. And then in the winter, we bring in sheep. So Mm. sheep are amazing. Uh, They take a lot of the tractor work away as they graze for us. So naturally, it rains. We sow our cover crop and then our cover crop grows. And it grows, in most years, grow too high where we would have to mow. But instead, we bring the sheep in and the sheep do the mowing for us. and. I mean, we could get down this rabbit hole of regenerative farming, <laughs> but basically the sheep, you know, they they poop and pee at the same time. They mow um, all of the plants, basically. It stimulates this kind of root exudase hormone response, and we can in turn store even more carbon with sheep grazing than with a tractor pass. So... Yeah, the sheep are great. Uh, when the sheep are in the vineyard, we're rotating them rotating all of the animals every three to four days. So our winters are fast and full, um, but <laughs> it's fun and kind of like going past the just soil health of integrating livestock into the vineyard. It creates like this really nice ambiance, this connection mm. with the human and animal and nature. Um, you really like, honestly, I feel like a kid every time I go put the ducks away and I talk to them and they follow me and I feed it with my hands. <laughs> it's really sweet. And it's really nice to have a bond with animals that are like, kind of like your employees and are, are, are working <laughs> nice. for you. You know, some people ask me like, Oh, do you eat your ducks? I'm like, no, man, what the heck? <laughs> 
<laughs> You're like, not yet, at least. <laughs> I know. One right? of them's not picking up as many slugs, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Get to work. I'm gonna see. Right. I need some quotas. <laughs> anyway, duck quotas. It's like chicken run or something. Um, so then, how does regenerative farming affect your decisions in the winery? Because we have all these things happening in the vineyard. Once you get into the winery, what happens yeah. then? You know, the whole um, kind of like my whole goal for winemaking um, in general and my wines and, you know, it's nice for anyone else that feels the same way is, is to be able to showcase the vineyard site as well as the vintage through the wines. So these grapes come into the cellar and they should be healthy and happy and not have any sort of um, botrytis or, or mildew and, and be able to, be as pure as possible um, in the cellar. So yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I don't add anything in the cellar, um, all native yeast, native bacteria, all neutral French oak in my wines. And that's just made to be able so the consumer can feel the sight and the vintage. And that to me is what's special. I don't necessarily want to have a heavy winemaking hand. I do think my wines tend to have a style but it's like a fresh style. It's a, a an energizing style rather than like a degree alcohol style or an mm. oak profile or anything like that. So you're taking a very natural approach in in the winery, as you know. Certainly, that term goes. Since it's not a legal right. designation. Are you doing any right. fining or filtering at all, or do you tend to kind of just? Yeah, no. All the wines are unfined and filtered, so it's you know very much uh, a living product when it comes to the bottle. Um, but yeah, so I think fining and filtering, they, although they can really clear up a wine and make it feel a little bit more tense, they also take, in my opinion, more away from the wine other than what you are after. So I've never fined or filtered any of the wines under the Envive label. And I mean, I think it's important to never like be absolutely dogmatic about anything, but, um, I hope to, I hope to never have to do that. Or never want to do that. All the work is yeah. happening in the in the vineyard. Exactly. No, and I use and and wine is has a mind of its own, right? It's yeah. and, and it's our job as winemakers to kind of guide it, especially as light touch winemakers to guide it. And we don't have that many tools when something goes wrong, other than yeah, there's like a few things I do, but like I don't know, putting a copper pipe in a barrel. Maybe some winemakers would. Not like that if your wine's super reduced, but I do that. Mm. It's a copper pipe. <laughs> um, so I like if a wine goes totally bad and it doesn't fit into my blends, which happens every year. There's a couple barrels that just don't quite fit. Um, mm. I bulk it off and, and sell it. So that's, that's just kind of my way of making sure that everything that goes into my wines is age worthy and um, mm. has a long longevity to be able to be enjoyed, which is important to me. You know, I fell in love with traditional wines and that's you know, like, that is the ultimate expression to me is to make a wine that is, has absolutely no ads and also withstands the test of time. It tastes delicious now, it tastes delicious in five years, it tastes delicious in 20 years. Like that is the goal, the ultimate goal. And you're working with a lot of Rhone varietals, correct? Mm -hmm. Predominantly Rhone yeah. varietals. Um, yeah, Rhone and Spanish. Rhone and Spanish. And are these all coming from the Ibarra Young Vineyard? Only some of them? Are you using other sites for the Almvive label? Yeah, no, thanks for asking. Um, yeah, so I at Ibarra Young, the old vines are Moved, Syrah, and Marsan. And we also, the young vine plantations that I talked about that were planted in the late 90s are Tempranillo and Graciano. So all of those grapes are from Ibarra Young. And then I also source grapes too, just to have a little bit more to play with. And, you know, the vineyard is really low yielding. It's a ton to a ton and a half to the acre every year in order to like make a business and um, <laughs> have a little bit more to play with uh, in the <laughs> cellar. Um, I source some other stuff too. So I also source Albarino, which kind of makes up the Spanish trio um, with <laughs> Tempranillo and Graciano. 
And I started Grenache Blanc, Grenache Noir, some extra Moved. I only have a half acre of Moved at Ibar Young, and I do a GSM. That's a pretty big skew for me. So I source Moved also. And um, Mondus, which doesn't fit into any of those regions, but <laughs> okay. You're like, but I want to, so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, oh, and Roussan, and I can't believe I'm saying this, Viognier this year. <laughs> <laughs> do you so, do you, are you do you not I'm like the Viognier that much? Again. I'm learning to love it again. I have made Viognier's that I really like. I do tend to pick it a little bit leaner at about eleven percent, eleven percent alcohol, something like that. Just because I don't love like the really viscous mid palate uh-huh. that a lot of these road mites get, and it's not just Viognier. But sometimes Viognier can be a little bit too aromatic, a little bit too viscous for Mm -hmm. um, my profile. And, you know, that kind of goes across the board for the Roan whites I make. I think you'll find that they're, they have this like really warm mid palette and this like really sunshiny expression, but there's also acid, which kind of carries it through and makes it pleasant. (sighs) I love good acid in wine. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Jeez. What do you think makes these varieties and and these wines coming out of Santa Barbara so unique? What about Santa Barbara makes those wines stand apart and and you know yeah. and have the singularity to Rhone varietals made in Rome? Yeah. I definitely think there is a Santa Barbara County expression. Maybe you feel the same. I've been doing this like blind flight thing uh, on Tuesday nights, which is great. And I'm learning a lot. Oh, it's nice. something that I haven't done since I was like, I don't know. I feel like the blind blind flight craze is like very, I did it like all of my friends did it when we were mid twenties and super passionate. And then I've kind mm-hmm. of like fallen off the bandwagon. So I'm trying to get my, trying to get my, uh, my stats back up here. Anyway, I'm getting yeah, distracted. Girl. But um, I tend to, you know, be able to pick out these Santa Barbara County wines um, very distinctly. I think it has a lot to do with the sunshine here. It is beautiful here. And it is bluebird and sunny. It feels like 85% of the year. Um, Not a cloud in the sky. And I think that adds a lot to the grapes. They're, you know, all of these different layers of anthocyanins and polyphenols and all of these things can develop with more ease with all of the sunshine. So yeah, Santa Barbara is quite diverse. So it's it's kind of a confusing region for somebody that's, I don't know, just learning about Santa Barbara. So I tend to source everything from kind of the eastern part of, of the region because the western part of the region is very more Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Cooler climate, less diurnal shift, um, much more maritime than mm. continental. And then over kind of in the Los Olivos, San Inez area, it tends to be much more continental. So very, very warm days, very, very cool nights, definitely harder frost, but still sunshine throughout. A lot of sunshine. I think that's what makes Santa Barbara <laughs> different. And yeah, because in the Rhone, it's not sunny in the winter. It's not, it's not as sunny in the spring. There's way more cloud cover in June, July than there is here. I would agree with that, honestly. Like, there's just a quality anytime I blind taste. There's like a couple regions or grapes in the world that like I can smell it in the glass, and I generally am like, that's a Santa Barbara, whatever. And it's it always is this like sunny quality to it that I just love. But also on the other hand, I think it was Richard Sanford that described it as the reason it was so unique is it's like refrigerated sunlight because you do have this like wonderful backbone. Just because it's sunny doesn't mean everything gets overripe and flabby. There's still this wonderful backbone and freshness to the wine along with the sunlight that I just find so singular. That's really, yeah, that's absolutely. Because even though it might be sunny, like it's beautiful sunny out, you know, it's still 50 degrees in the shade. You know, and then you go step out into the sunlight and it might be 70, 75 at this time of day. Yeah. It's special here. It's really nice. And so how much <laughs> wine are you making? How big of an operation um, is En Vive? So this year, 2023, I made about 2,500 cases. So 30,000 wow. bottles. Wow. I know. 
<laughs> You're like, I don't. Hey, I'm aware. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think that's, um, that's kind of like my happy number, maybe grow a little bit, a little bit more, but mm-hmm. that number feels really good. I, it's, yeah, it's enough to sustain two people, um, and maybe a third, but mm-hmm. you know, I, I don't, I don't necessarily desire to have this like huge enterprise of people working underneath me. Um, I think I'll lose touch of what I love if I, if I do that. Yeah. Fun. And I have to say, your labels are so beautiful. It's one of the first things Thank that you. stood out to me about, other than, you know, the wine itself. But are you are you designing those yourself? Yeah, me and my mom. Um, wow. So, They're really pretty. Yeah, uh, my mom paints the fronts and I paint the backs. And then I do all the um, handwriting for each of the labels. It's my handwriting. And... Yeah, so all of the labels are based on the native flora and fauna that we see every day. So kind of if you line them all up, you see, you have a little feeling of of, of the vineyard or the site. So thank you. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah, they're gorgeous. Thanks. It's fun. They're, yeah, I've got to make a couple more this year. So I've got some new skews. And it's fun to be able to walk around and find something that strikes you and make a label on it. Pink. Yeah. But yeah, this whole like... My whole project of On Beave is it's a way to get out all different sorts of creative stuff that I have, both winemaking wise and, you know, continuing to ask, ask the questions farming wise and being able to take photos and paint and write. It's so much fun. It's so much fun. And so what are, are there any other projects you're working on outside of On Beave at the moment? Are you making wine for anybody else or what are you yeah, up to? Yeah, I've got a few projects. So, um... <laughs> In addition to Ambiv, kind of my other biggest responsibility that I love is I work for a farming company called Cosecha Farming. The owner is Chris King and Deanna King. So we farm most famously like Domaine de la Cote and another one of Sashi's um, projects. We farm Adam Tolmax's State Vineyard, Faciega. We farm Joy Fantastic, which is owned by Peter and Amy Hunkin, and a couple other like smaller vineyards in San Inez. So... Yeah, that's, that's, that's amazing. A lot. I yeah, it's and <laughs> it's a lot. lot of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. So I get my um Pinot Chard fix growing grapes for them and then get to go over to to my my easy farming out out in the valley. It's it's truly special. It's definitely easier to farm in, in warmer climates. And then I also make wine for some people who own this beautiful winery that I get to make wine in and their project hasn't like quite been fully announced yet so we we'll got that so we got to keep our eyes peeled for that then <laughs> yeah Fabulous. Man's in the hard launch well I'll, I'll keep my eyes peeled for sure everybody else should too <laughs> and then for Omviv, what are your your hopes for that moving forward obviously keeping it you know at this this nice level that you're at but you, do you want to work with are there any other grape that you want to work with at all or yeah I'd love forward? to like yeah I mean any sort of like odd Rhone grape is of interest to me, like Terret Noir, or oh. I'd like to grow my own um, Carignan. Um, oh, yeah. But yeah, so I, yeah, I'd like to be almost entirely in house farming. So looking for other vineyards to lease and farm myself, I would love to do that. Uh, I'm trying, but it's actually quite hard to find a, a good vineyard to lease. Yeah, it is like something that like the size makes sense. And, you know, everyone wants to be a farmer now, which is amazing. And you should because it's the best job in the world. But um, <laughs> yeah, there's a couple of new SKUs that I that I made this year that I'm excited about. I made Roussan for the first time under Omvies this year and a, a white co-ferment, which would be cool. Ooh. So yeah, always just, you know, trying to, I mean, that's, it's the beauty of doing this is if you have kind of a, an intrigued mind, it's, there's always something to learn, um, always questions to ask, always like little things to tweak that can make a big difference. Yeah, I love that. I love uh, I love that about myself. And I think it makes the wines continue to evolve and just continue to be better. Agreed. And where could we, can you let us know where we can find um, Vive Wines and, and where we can follow you on social media as well so that we can follow along? Yeah, sure. So my Instagram is omvive.wine. 
A M E V I V E dot wine. That's my Instagram. And yeah, I post a lot there, lots of stories. And then, yeah, I've got wine all over the world. So states are confusing, but states wise, California, Colorado, New York, Georgia, North and South Carolina, a couple more states in the works for next year, for sure, as far as like restaurants and retail goes. But we ship to um, many states. You can buy wine if it is available, which tends to be right about release. They're hot. Um, On my website. Alice's wines are hot right now. So if you want her wines from the website, get on there now. Because it looks like you just found a few cases of some goodies. Uh, I just noticed that. I'm like, I got to buy these now before they're gone. Yeah, I just, um, my friend Rachel helped me count inventory. And uh, yeah, a couple. Ca- I put a couple of cases up of Ravi and a couple of cases up of Gamay from this year. So those are available. Ugh. If you feel like some some holiday delights. But otherwise, I have a release uh, usually beginning of April and beginning of September each year. So you can sign up for the mailing list. That will be the first place that I tell you wines are live, and then eventually I post on Instagram. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Alice, so much for your time. It's it's great to chat with you and you're making me want to come up and, and visit the Abara Young Vineyard and just watch the ducks and the sheep and the all the wildlife and enjoy some wine with you. So I'm going to have you're to come welcome. up there and hang with you. And everybody, please go check out En Vive Wines on social. Go buy the wines wherever you can again before they're gone, before I buy them all. And Alice, <laughs> thanks again. Cheers. Yeah, thank you. Cheers. <laughs> I want to thank everybody for listening to today's podcast, especially Claire Copey for hosting and Alice Anderson for talking about your operation in Santa Barbara. These are great wines. I want to remind everybody that William Selium, our Behind the Glass episode, is now streaming on Som TV or about to launch, depending on what time you're listening to this. Go to SomTV.com and give the best gift for the holiday season. There are hundreds and hundreds of hours of the best educational and entertainment in the food and wine space. SomTV.com is the gift you should be giving for Christmas. I also want to tell you, Cup of Salvation is playing in L.A. and New York through the 21st, so it's your last chance to see it in the theater in those two places. We're announcing more dates, and I know you want to see it digitally. Those dates are coming very soon. We're going to announce that. And if you're a Psalm TV subscriber, you'll be happy. And I want to remind everybody, our Behind the Glass episode of William Selyam is out right now on Psalm TV. Give that a watch. And if you are looking for a gift for anybody in the food and wine space, SomTV.com is one of the best gifts you can have. You can watch it on any device that you stream your movies or shows. Everybody be safe, be nice to your family during the holidays, and get yourself some good wine. That'll help. Talk to you all very soon. Bye.